Welcome to part two of my chairlift comparison video series comparing two chairlifts on Lauchenrad that are 30 years apart. In last week's video, after an introduction, I presented you the top and bottom station of each of the two chairlifts, I showed the clamping mechanisms and explained how the motors work. In this week's video, you are going to find out how the motors are driven. I'm gonna show you all the high voltage components as well as the complex sensor systems that track the chairs throughout their course. Clearly, these are big wheels turning. How is the electrical power for these strong motors controlled? Let us start with the newer Bartolet lift. Serial is bringing me to the frequency converter I mentioned earlier in the video. This room is kept under low pressure and we'll soon find out why. This cupboard contains the frequency converters of the smaller motors in the slower sections. All of these devices are only for controlling the tires at the Bartolet's bottom station. The copper to the right contains a single much bigger converter, namely the one controlling the main motor. Cyril gives me a rough sketch of what's going on inside these frequency converters, but he warns me that operators only have limited knowledge about this. Basically, the 50 Hz frequency from the power grid is first converted to DC and then reconverted to AC again, but with a controllable frequency that will then affect the motor's velocity. In other words, the speed of each motor is controlled here in this room. The motor itself is just a glorified array of magnets driven by the signal coming from its converter. The converters are themselves driven by a low voltage signal issued by these controllers that are in turn fed with data and coordinated by the control computer. So in summary, the chairlift software orchestrates everything and calculates the required speed for each motor at a given instant. It sends its instructions to the controllers, which send a signal to the converters, which in turn boost that signal by adjusting the frequency at which their target motor is powered, making the motor rotate at the speed dictated by the computer. Oof, I hope I got this right, let me know in the comments. The reason why this room is under low pressure is because for cooling the air is not pushed into it but sucked out of it. The exhaust air is then pumped into the snow groomer garage where it melts away the snow from the snow grooming machines. This way the heat produced by the converters is not even wasted. After enjoying this modern solution, let's look at how the 1986 chairlift drives its motor. Remember that this is a DC motor, so we just need to convert the AC from the grid once. These devices look similar to flushing and they protect the grid against noise. The next step would be to use a thyristor to perform the actual AC-DC conversion. However, such solid state electronics were only at their beginnings back in the day. In fact, the chairlift is just old enough to still use the ancient Ward Leonard motor control system, which was patented in 1891. The schematic may look a little complicated at first sight, but the underlying system is so simple that we can easily tinker it at home. Imagine that this little motor is the ropeway's main motor that drives the rope. It's a DC motor, which is what they needed at the time to be able to control its speed. Its DC nature can easily be shown by connecting the motor to a battery, which is also DC. Now, we cannot simply plug this motor into the AC power grid. Anyway, we need to convert the AC to DC for this motor to work. Nowadays, 130 years after the invention of the ward Leonard principle, this would be an easy task. However, back in the late 19th century, the technology to build solid-state rectifiers that we use today was far from being discovered. So instead, we must use the primitive technology that was available back at 1890, AC and DC motors. This ancient drill is a simple on-off AC motor. Maybe you still remember from school that an electrical motor is also a generator. So let's add a second DC motor and have the drill power it. When the drill spins it, the motor generates electricity. The energy losses are incredibly high and the output voltage is ridiculous. So let's use a larger motor and see if we can get a voltage level that's high enough to make this demonstration work. 7 volts, that should be plenty. Now we connect our DC motor, the one that symbolizes the ropeway's main motor, to the generator. 
In summary, the AC power grid powers the drill's AC motor, which mechanically drives the DC generator, which produces 7 volts that are applied to our DC motor that symbolically drives the ropeway. It works, so let's look at the schematic again. In practice, the AC motor, labeled with the number 1, symbolized by the drill in the experiment, cannot cold start the whole assembly. Thus another motor, labeled number 3, is used to start up the whole assembly. Once started, the AC motor powers the generator, labeled number 2, which drives the main motor, labeled number 4. The ward Leonor principle is as simple as that, so here is what the real thing looks like. scared the crap out of me. The motor to the left looks the same as the ropeway's main motor, so that's actually the generator. It is driven by the AC motor that sits in the middle of the assembly and the whole thing is started by the smaller variable AC motor on the right. All of this does the same thing as just that. Lots of evolution happened here in the past decades. Another thing that we are used to in the modern world are advanced sensors. In the newer Bartolet lift, the stations are bristled with magnetic initiators that precisely track the position of each chair and report it to the computer. The yellow component that closes the clamp is even equipped with a sensor that measures the pressure that the clamp responds with when it is closed. If the pressure is out of bounds, an emergency stop is triggered. These red sensor blinds are located immediately after the clamp is closed. They surround the clamp and get triggered if the clamp does not perfectly embrace the rope. This kind of sensor can be found throughout the station. Some of them are responsible for surveillance of the clamps and some of them check that the rope has its exact position. As an extra safety measure, additionally, this purely mechanical device either brutally slams the clamp closed or jams the entire chair here in case the clamp has failed to close. This is a last resort designed to keep a chair from falling down at all cost, even if the equipment gets damaged in the process. Luckily, it has never seen any action. Back to the older Garaventa lift. Now, how might this look over 30 years earlier? Actually, not even that different. Even though much older and looking differently, these initiators have the same task as their newer siblings. They track the vehicles throughout their course in a station and trigger an emergency stop if a vehicle is too fast or slow. We also find a mechanical piece forcing the clamps shut or jamming the chair if all fails. On this lift it was retrofitted, in order to comply with the regulations that tightened compared to the old days. What surprised me though to find on this older lift is the clamp pressure sensor. In this lift it is separate from the coupling mechanism. It lifts the spring and if the required force does not match the specification an error is issued and the ropeway is brought to a stop. And also just like the other this lift is equipped with sensor blinds. The one shown in this picture gets triggered if the rope hangs too low. The exact positioning of the rope is crucial for the coupling to succeed. This is another sensor blind that is triggered if the clamp is not closed correctly. To illustrate how this sensor works, Cyril triggers it, causing a well-controlled emergency stop. Again, I cannot thank Cyril enough for how incredibly thorough he explains and demonstrates everything. And that's it for part 2 of this video series. Be sure to stay tuned for next week's video, the final part number 3. We'll be looking deeply into the controller systems, the mechanical brain of each of the chairlifts. I'll explain you what happens when a chair breaks down and must be taken out of the loop. You'll learn a few surprising facts about the ropes or cables. And of course, you'll get to look into the garaging procedure, Monster Sync all over again. So thanks for watching and I'm looking forward to hopefully 
we see you again next week. Goodbye.